We've reached the chapter that everybody's been waiting for. Chapter 41 is the final chapter of the textbook. And it's going to discuss the EMS response to terrorism. Um, obviously, in today's day, uh, terrorism's become more common uh, than it was even 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, so it's something that hopefully you're not exposed to, but the potential is there. So uh, this chapter is going to run through the different uh, types of terrorism that you may see, um, safeguards against them, things to look for, how to respond, um, what to do. Again, as an EMS provider, uh, it's going to be pretty basic. You're not going to be incident command more than likely. Um, so you're going to kind of do as you're told more than anything. So the technical definition of terrorism is going to be the unlawful use of force or violence against persons or property to intimidate or coerce a government, the civilian population, or any segment thereof in furtherance of political or social objectives. Um, and that is defined by the U.S. Department of Justice and the FBI. Um, like we talked about, terrorism, it's... It's more common than ever, um, and every year it seems to be growing more and more because now it's not just the Al-Qaeda as the terrorists of the world. Now you have domestic terrorists, which could be an individual person that's trying to do this. Um, so we're probably only going to see more of this in the future uh, as we move through time. So the domestic terrorism, they're going to be groups or individuals uh, who their terrorist activities are going to be directed towards their own government or population. So those are people that reside within the United States that are attacking the United States or the people or property there of the United States. And there are going to be different groups that are going to do this. You see these in the news. Um, you probably all understand um, what these groups are. There's a certain amount of subjectiveness uh, based on your own political views as to, you know, one one group of people may say group A is a terrorist and another, another group say, no, they're patriots. Um, so when they actually do um, the physical activity that makes them a terrorist, so you have groups that, you know, are focused around the environmental aspects. You have anti-government groups. So um, the big thing in the news in 2022 is the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Um, and that was an anti-government uh, action. And like I said, it's subjective. You might think it's a terrorism act, whereas the person sitting next to you might think it's a patriotic act. Um, it just depends on the situation and, and the thought process. You have racial hate groups. So you have um, you know, the, the recent one where uh, the two or three uh, white Southern folk shot and killed a black man in the back that was uh, jogging down. It was an anti-hate racial attack because the individual was African-American. Um, you have groups with extreme political, uh, religious, or other philosophies or beliefs. So, um, you know, you have the the far extremist groups um, like the Waco compound fire of years ago. They were a very extremist group and their act of terrorism was really amongst themselves when they said, if we can have our way, we're going to torch it and everybody here is going to die. Um, but that was just an extreme belief of theirs. Um, so you have all these different groups or individuals um, who can basically create these terrorist activities. And the flip side of domestic is going to be international terrorism. Um, and these can be individuals 
um, that are looking to basically attack the foreign countries or groups outside the targeted country, um, or it can be organized groups. When you think about international terrorism, um, you're probably thinking of the groups like Al Qaeda um, that are very organized, very well funded uh, groups that can cause significant terror around the world with what they do. Um, now, the world has kind of come against these terrorist groups and they're targeting them. So now you're starting to see this growing trend of loosely organized international networks of terrorists because they're much harder to track, they're much harder to um, take care of, find, and basically eliminate the threat. Um, so that's kind of what the trend is moving towards right now. You're gonna find this CBRNE throughout the chapter. Um, and what this discusses is um, the different um, forms, agents, um, or what we call them, um, of terrorism, and that being chemical, biologic, radiologic, nuclear, and explosive. Um, when you see CBRNE, another way to think of it are these are usually the weapons of mass destruction, so the WMD that you hear all the time in the news as well. Now we're going to move into terrorism and EMS and, um, you know, a quick visual of the Twin Towers, September 11th, 2001, changed the world forever um, as it looks at terrorism. Um, I assure you that, my, I guess my guess would be the terrorists figured we're going to crash these planes into the buildings, we're going to kill some people in the buildings, we're going to kill everybody on the plane, but what they probably didn't anticipate was the after effects of what was going to happen when the buildings collapsed. Um, so from the terrorist standpoint, that probably far exceeded what their initial goals were with the attack, um, because when the building collapsed, it killed everybody for the most part in the building, plus it killed all the responders in and around the buildings. So, um, there are obviously a lot of things that you have to know and understand as an EMS provider, um, with safety being one of them. Like I said, this is one of the lessons that was learned at the 9-11 attacks. And then since September 11th, um, there has been an increase basically in that the emergency medical responders are often a principal target of the terrorist attack um, through uh, secondary um, explosions, secondary attacks, whatever the case may be. So from an EMS standpoint, it's really important to consider when you're responding to these potential terrorist incident, when you should enter. And basically, you got to put your scene safety first so you don't enter until whoever the ultimate authority is, whether it's the FBI, um, local police, uh, whatever the case is, you kind of go off of what they tell you when it's safe to enter because um, you don't want to put yourself in harm's way. So like like we discussed, sometimes you are going to be targeted, um, and this is done through either multiple or secondary devices. So as you enter the scene and as you go to your staging area, just be cognizant of what's going on. Be aware of your surroundings. Um, be aware of the area that you're in and the dangers that it could pose um, because a, a terrorist may have kind of pre-planned things in advance that, hey, when I attack here, this is where they're gonna stage. This is where I could put some secondary devices. Um, so, you know, just be cognizant that you, potentially could see, you know, dangers out there. Not to say that you may go there and have no idea and if a secondary device goes off, the secondary device goes off. But in these situations, have a heightened level of awareness. Also remember that any incident with the potential act of terrorism is also gonna be a crime scene. 
So if you enter something that you had no idea was a terrorist event, um, just understand that it's a crime scene. You try to preserve everything. Um, once you recognize what it is, make sure that you communicate to the proper places and channels uh, what needs to be done moving forward. Another acronym to put in the back of your head here is AUTO, um, and this is going to help you uh, recognize, protect against the secondary attack. So AUTO stands for occupancy or location, type of event, timing of event, and on-scene warning signs. So the next handful of slides here uh, will walk you through kind of what this is. So the first one is occupancy or location. If you get called to one of these type of areas, just keep it in the back of your head, the potential of it being a terrorist attack. So the targets that we're looking at here are uh, symbolic or historical uh, targets, um, famous places, a Statue of Liberty, um, Wall Street Financial District's been hit a couple times, um, places like that. Uh, public buildings or assembly areas. Um, tell me if these don't sound familiar. We've had a, a rash of shopping mall incidents here in the recent history. Um, entertainment venues, uh, movie theaters we've had happen previous, um, sporting arenas. Then you have controversial businesses. So these are going to be um, Places like family planning clinics, nuclear facilities, um, any sort of research facility, um, large scale commercial development areas. And then the last thing is going to be infrastructure systems. Um, so areas of mass transit, um, bridges, power plants, um, hospitals potentially. Um, so if you're in one of these locations for a call, um, just keep it in the back of your head that it could be that. Next thing to think about is what type of event is it? Um, so anything with explosions or incendiaries um, should raise your level of concern. Um, you know, the Boston bombing during the marathon, um, the explosion with that, um, incidents involving firearms. These are going to be the um, common ones, it seems like, uh, where you have mass shootings. Um, they're becoming more and more frequent. Now you can go on to Google and pull up a map of mass shootings in the United States for 2022, and you'd be surprised um, how many of them that there have been. Um, and then the more sophisticated ones are going to be the non-trauma mass casualty incidents, because you may not suspect it as a terrorist event when you get there, um, because of the nature of what's going on, it doesn't really seem like a terrorist event. Um, but a really sophisticated terrorist can make it look like it's not a terrorist event um, intentionally. Um, so just keep it in the back of your mind anytime you have a non-trauma mass casualty incident. Third thing to look at here is going to be the timing of the event. Um, so commonly terrorists will use national holidays. Um, they they want to use um, dates of significance um, to leave their mark basically on, on the country. So national holidays are a common one. Anniversary dates of previous attacks. Um, so every year on September 11th right now, there's a heightened threat that there's concern for another terrorist attack. Uh, incidents occurring in major public areas at the busiest point of the busiest day. Um, so a lot of times, um, you know, rush hour or as fans are exiting an arena from a football game, whatever the case may be, um, those are areas of concern as well. And then the, the final part of this acronym uh, is on-scene warning signs. So just be cognizant of unexplained patterns of illnesses or death um, and unexplained signs and symptoms, whether it's of the skin, eyes, or airway irritation. Um, if you have multiple patients, kind of have a heightened level of concern that it could be a terrorist attack. Um, and then 
always you know visualize the area look for things that are out of place containers that are out of place um, similarly to when we talked about uh, drug abuse and you're looking for uh, indicators like syringes things like that um, same concept with terrorism look for things that seem out of place if there's a question pass on the information so somebody can look into it to implement the self-protection measures you must first understand the different types of harms that you might be exposed to um, and they use this trace mp harms kind of acronym to help you hopefully remember it not that you don't have a thousand other acronyms that you have to remember right now um, but the first step of this is going to be the thermal harm which is going to be uh, caused by extreme uh, heat and or cold um, generated by burning liquids or metals next one's going to be radiological harm um, which is from the alpha particles beta particles or gamma rays that are generally produced by uh, nuclear events um, you know nuclear fuels and and they're the byproduct of nuclear production or nuclear bombs uh, this will be a little bit of a rarity but again um, it is a potential threat next one is going to be asphyxiation um, which is going to be caused by a lack of oxygen in the atmosphere so any chemical um, that can decrease the oxygen level to below 19.5 percent which is what you need for um, normal breathing um, can be a threat to you as well. C is going to be the chemical harm, um, which is going to include uh, acids and other chemical toxins ranging from cyanides to nerve agents. Etiologic harm is going to be the uh, concerns over the causes of disease, whether it comes from uh, organisms such as bacteria or viruses. Uh, M is going to be the mechanical harm. Um, going to be the common one, any sort of physical trauma, gunshot wounds, um, bomb fragments, shrapnel, things like that. Um, and really the one that is almost occurs in almost every event is the psychological harm. And it's truly, usually the goal of the terrorist is to create this uh, psychological fear uh, in them. So it um, it's going to result from any violent event. Your protection as the EMT is going to be based on avoiding or minimizing exposure through three basic principles of time, distance, and shielding. Time is going to be minimizing your amount of time in the danger area or exposed to the hazardous material, radiation, biological agent. Um, get in, get your job done, get out. Execute rapid entries um, and really just as quickly as you can least amount of time possible um, distance is going to be to maximize your distance from the hazard area uh, or projected hazard area so um, when you roll up on these depending on what the situation is uh, if you need to make sure to use that erg follow the guidelines uh, that are put forth within that book it's a great tool um, with any sort of hazardous material situation use the appropriate shielding to address specific hazards um, you know you might be shielded within vehicles or buildings um, but you might be just what you're wearing might be your shielding too whether it's a hazmat suit um, or just down to a simple ppe um, the other proponent of shielding that you really don't think about is vaccination so you're preemptively attacking whatever the hazardous material is uh, agent is that they're trying to use in the terroristic event um, you're vaccinating against it so that you're protected before you're ever even exposed now we'll move into the response the ems response to these incidents um, and the kind of some of the different classifications here so first one's going to be a response to a chemical incident uh, it, this is going to include many classes of hazardous materials, so make sure you're using that ERG book. Um, and these can be inhaled, ingested, absorbed, or injected. Um, so just understand the situation that you're walking into. 
Um, it can be industrial chemicals. If you're at a chemical plant such as say 3M uh, can be used, uh, but it can be warfare type agents as well. From our acronym, the things that be concerned about here are thermal harm, asphyxiation, and then chemical harm, as well as the mechanical harm, um, which is going to be the corrosive chemicals that weaken the structures. And then the, the uniform common one is going to be the psychological harm, um, either secondary or either at the scene. Um, but this can be, you know, prolonged after the event as well. So for your self-protection measures at these chemical incidents, uh, make sure that you're utilizing respiratory protection. Make sure you're utilizing the proper protective clothing. Um, and then be aware that your patients may be contaminated. Um, so they may need to go through a decontamination process, um, but you don't want to get contaminated from a patient uh, in that situation. Moving to responses to a biological incident. So these are going to present as either a focused emergency or a public health emergency. Focused emergency is going to be kind of as it sounds. It's going to be focused on the point of origin um, where it occurred. Um, so the what the goal here is going to be, you want to prevent or minimize damage or spread. So it's usually going to be a smaller number, smaller area um, that hopefully can be controlled. Now, a public health emergency is going to be a, a sudden demand upon the public health infrastructure with no apparent explanation. And I'll just use COVID as a, a potential hypothesis in the aspect of uh, what if COVID was, the coronavirus was put out there as a weaponized virus that they didn't understand would spread like it did. Um, that is what potentially could create a public health emergency when you're thinking about a biological incident. I'm by no means saying that's what happened. I'm just using it as an example of what the potential is and what how the public health emergency plays into it. The agents that may cause harm by being inhaled or ingested in the body are going to be bacteria, viruses, and toxins. Now, bacteria uh, is going to be grown outside of the body, but it can produce a toxin that poses the danger. So the example of this in your book is going to be anthrax. Um, it can be weaponized and used as in a terrorist event. Um, viruses are going to be uh, only inside of the living cells, um, and then they can spread rapidly. Um, back to my previous slide, let's say that you weaponized uh, the coronavirus and it spreads and it kills people. Um, that would be an example of a virus. Um, and then toxins are poisons produced by living, or, living organisms um, that may produce uh, bacteria, fungi, flowering plants, insects, fish, reptiles, mammals, um, Example of this is going to be uh, ricin, um, which can also be weaponized and used in a terrorist event. With the biological incidents, what's the difference between an exposure and a contamination? So an exposure is going to be the dose or the concentration of an agent multiplied uh, by time. Um, the dose being the milligrams per kilogram of body weight, the concentration being the parts per million. So an exposure is, is usually based on a specific number. Um, your textbook says it's 150 pound male. So if you're a 300 pound male, uh, the exposure is going to take really double the concentration of the agent uh, to cause the damage. Um, now, if you're a 100 pound female, it's going to take less. So those are a couple of things to keep in mind when you're thinking about exposure and why does this person have more serious signs and symptoms than this person? It might be that they're targeted with the, the same concentration of an agent, um, but because the dynamics of the two human bodies, they react in different ways. 
The four major routes of entry of this biological agent are going to be absorption, which is going to be through the skin, ingestion, which is going to be by the mouth, um, injection, which is going to be needles or projectiles that would uh, force uh, the biological agent into you, or inhalation simply by breathing. So what is contamination? Uh, it's when a material is present where it doesn't belong. Um, the material um, that is harmful to persons, animals, and or the environment, um, but it's usually on the surface. So things that can be contaminated are gonna be hard and soft surfaces, skin and hair, and clothing. Usually you can take care of a contamination by deconning it through whatever means depending on the material. Um, but if you don't decon the material off of the patient, then that's when it can become an exposure. So you want to get them decontaminated as soon as possible um, to prevent further injury or illness to the patient. So when you look at exposure versus contamination, exposure occurs when a substance is taken into the body through one of the routes of exposure. So this is going to be the um, worst case of the two. Contamination is going to be um, when it's on the surface um, and has not penetrated just yet. So if they've been contaminated, you want to remove the clothing, preserve their dignity, give them a blanket, give them, um, you know, a, a paper gown, whatever the case may be, um, so that they can have their dignity. But you want to get the contamination off of them decon them so that you don't have to worry about the exposure. And the harms that you need to be worried about with biological incidents are going to be um, obviously the chemical harm. Um, the etiologic harm is actually going to be the primary type of harm. And then you have mechanical harm and that's when explosives are used to disperse the agent. Um, so it's, it's not the agent that's causing you the harm, it's the explosion for, of them spreading the agent that's causing the harm. And then the universal harm is always that psychological harm. The self-protection measures that you need to look for with the biological incident are going to be your basic PPE and respiratory protection. Try to gather as much information as you can uh, and take that information either to get the agencies there you need to be there or take it to the hospital with you so that they know what they're dealing with when they're treating the patient um, and then you need to prioritize your protective measures using self-protection the buddy system um, get the rapid intervention teams uh, there that can handle the situation um, and then civilian protection um, which is basically going to be taking that civilian pop and moving them to a secure spot where they're going to be protected uh, the greatest. Moving on to responses to a radiologic nuclear incident. Hopefully it's not anything you ever have to deal with. Uh, however, uh, if you are where we are located, you do have a nuclear power plant uh, in a neighboring district uh, that is always of concern. Um, but a couple different devices um, that could be used. So one is the suitcase bomb. Um, which these are uh, stockpiled in um, foreign nations. Uh, they're going to be well put together. Um, it's it's going to be a very well organized situation. And then you have a radiologic dispersion device, which is a dirty bomb. It's um, going to be the more practical one because um, it's just not as well organized. I'm not saying anybody can put it together, but um, the lower level terrorists could probably figure out how to do a dirty bomb. Um, the issue with them is they're difficult to detect because the radiation symptoms are usually delayed for hours or days. Um, if you can figure it out early, the sickness is treatable. Um, longer you wait, the poorer the outcome is gonna be for the patient. The types of harm that we're looking at with radiologic nuclear incidents, uh, with a nuclear explosion, thermal harm is gonna be the primary type of harm. 
However, with a radiological event, um, the radiological harm is going to be the primary. So it just depends on, on the actual situation. Um, and then the radiological harm is going to be an ongoing hazard as well. Another thing that's kind of secondary is going to be the chemical burn. Um, and that's because most radiological substances are also chemical hazards. Um, and this is often overlooked by the responders. So um, it is something that you need to think about. Then you have the mechanical harm, um, which is going to be the damage caused from the actual explosion, um, the physical damage. And then again, as always, you're going to have the psychological harm. Your self-protection measures that you need to think of are going to be uh, big time use the time distance shielding uh, method. Don't go where you shouldn't go. Utilize radiologic detecting equipment that helps determine uh, the effectiveness of measures. Um, so basically, us being a neighboring district to the nuclear plant, we have a case of radiation detection equipment. If we go on to a scene there, we take that with us. Everybody gets a, it looks like almost like a pin light, and then that measures the level of radiation that you've been exposed to um, so that you can, it'll give you an alert once it's reached a certain level. Um, and then assume the dissemination of radiologic, biological, or chemical materials um, with any explosion until it's been ruled out. And then finally, follow your decontamination procedures. Make sure that everything is decon properly so that you don't take it into your ambulance, take it into the hospital, uh, and create more issues down the road. Now we'll move on to responses to an explosive incident. Um, and these can this can be a wide variety of devices, anything from small pipe bombs to large vehicle bombs. Um, obviously, small pipe bombs have been used in um, school settings, all kinds of areas. And then when you think of larger vehicle bombs, uh, World Trade Center, the first time it was bombed down in the garage was a vehicle bomb. Uh, the Oklahoma State terrorist event was a large vehicle bomb. Uh, so those have happened in our country. You hear about them all the time on the news overseas where a car bomb strikes a, a gate where there's military personnel, um, but they have been used in this country as well. Um, it, it may be involve attacks on a fixed target like in Oklahoma City. It may be a group of people um, like most car bombs uh, overseas. It just depends on who the terrorist is um, that is doing the damage. Um, it may be also used to disperse biologic, chemical, or radiologic materials. Now, maybe it's just a bomb and they're just trying to do damage by through an explosion, um, but th it could be a dirty bomb where they're um, putting a chemical out there to hopefully cause further damage beyond it. So be aware of that if you ever respond to one of these situations. The types of harm with these explosive incidents, with the initial blast, there's going to be a heat from the detonation that can cause thermal harm. Uh, you have the possibility of asphyxiation um, due to uh, the dust and, and just the impure air that's going to be caused from an explosion. Also, some of these explosions are designed to suck the oxygen out, um, which is going to cause uh, for possible asphyxiation as well. Um, you could have chemical harm. Um, resulting from the chemicals present at the detonation site as well. Obviously, the most common is going to be the mechanical harm uh, from all the shrapnel and debris of the actual explosion. And then, again, as always, the psychological harm. Um, the stun response can be seconds, minutes. There's going to be a delayed response. Um, and sometimes this can goes into a post-traumatic stress disorder for these patients as well. So you may pick up a psychological exam from somebody that served in Iraq 15 years ago that they have PTSD from an event like this. So something to keep in mind. Your self-protective measures are going to be um, both pre-blast and post-blast with these explosive incidents. Pre-blast being um, if somebody puts out a threat, a verbal warning, but there's not been any explosions just yet. Um, and then you have the post-blast when there's been at least one detonation. 
There could be multiple detonations further down the road. So you need protection both uh, pre-blast and post-blast. It is important as an EMS responder to understand the dissemination uh, and weaponization of these uh, CBR and E materials. Um, the first, which is going to be the most effective and most common means of dissemination, is going to be the respiratory route. Uh, you guys learned through the respiratory chapters um, just how delicate of an area that is. Um, this provides the terrorist the opportunity to maybe provide the most lethal means um, if they can do something that's going to enter the respiratory route. Um, it's a vast and delicate surface area. Um, the passageway is narrow as they get further into the lungs, um, which makes it much easier for things to become trapped in there. Um, that's why the terrorist, if they can, would prefer to have something that's going to have an effect on the respiratory route. Other routes that you could see are going to be the ingestion route, um, which is just when they ingest it. You have the dermal route, which is going to be uh, on the surface and cause damage through the surface area of the body. And then you have human to human contact, um, which is going to be a difficult one. Um, it can have a delayed incubation period and it can infect a large population prior to being detected. So if a country were to say weaponize smallpox, um, or some viral hemorrhagic fever, you may not know until there is a, a large number of cases um, that creates kind of a buzz to say, hey, something's going on, what is it? Uh, and they may never track it back either. So, um, but it is, there's the potential there that you could see something along those lines. It, it's kind of scary if you think about it, everything that could be weaponized within the world. And like I said, you know, thinking about things that could be weaponized, it makes it very scary. And if you were a terrorist, your goal target would be to do it through the inhalation route. It's going to be the most effective way. Um, if you can create something that has particles three to five microns in diameter, that's going to be the most effective way to infiltrate the respiratory system and cause the most damage. Um, you know, heat explosives um, and sprayers can aerosolize material. So just because you go to an explosion, you need to be concerned beyond what that explosion was and the damage that the actual um, physical nature of the explosion caused. Is there more to it? Is there something that maybe was weaponized? Now, you know, it's the percentage of running into this in your career is so minute. But again, it's something that you need to be cognizant of. It's something you need to think about when you're in the field. Another thing that's important is understanding the characteristics of the various CBR and E agents. <clears throat> so the chemical agent considerations that we need to think about are going to be over the next uh, few pages here. So the first thing's the physical considerations. Understand that these agents can be a gas, a liquid, or a solid. The vapor pressures and the densities are going to vary greatly across the spectrum depending on all kinds of different uh, components to it. The volatility considerations with it. Uh, low boiling point, high vapor pressure will evaporate more readily. Um, it's going to allow the agent to have a greater airborne release uh, potential. Uh, the bad news is the more volatile um, a material is, the greater the airborne concentration will be. So just a couple things to keep in mind. Not really anything tremendous from an EMS standpoint. Um, more informational that just to understand how these agents work a little better. Next thing to consider is the uh, chemical consideration. Um, and the only general characteristic of the known chemical agents is that they are sufficiently stable to survive dissemination and transport to the site of their action. Uh, and then you have the toxicologic 
consideration and you need to understand that not all individuals of species react in the same way um, and the route can a route of entry can also influence um, the consideration as well so like my middle child is at uh, just got done with basic training one of the things they had to do was go into the tear gas chamber with their gas masks on and then they had to pull their gas masks off some people you would have thought that they were dying watching the video and then some people could basically stand in there and they didn't have any reaction to it so there are considerations uh, depending on the the people you know race genetics thing like that all play a part in this sludge m is going to be the mnemonic used to remember the signs and symptoms of the nerve nerve agent poison um, because these nerve agents are going to have an action on the parasympathetic nervous system so you have salivation lacrimation urination defecation gi upset emesis and meiosis um, meiosis is going to be an abnormal contraction of the pupils these chemical agents are then classified into some broader categories uh, first one being uh, choking agents which are predominantly respiratory irritants um, many of these common industrial chemicals are classified as simple as fixia such as chlorine you have vesicating agents uh, which these agents cause chemical changes in the cells of exposed tissues um, almost immediately on contact so these are going to be your blistering agents then you have cyanides which are they work by preventing the use of oxygen within the body cell so basically they are uh, asphyxiating you at the cellular level next you have the nerve agents um, which these inhibit an enzyme uh, that's critical to proper nerve transmission um, so it's going to allow the parasympathetic nervous system to basically run out of control uh, many of the nerve agents are stronger versions of common pesticides and organophosphates um, there is treatment for these some of these anyway so just follow your your protocols uh, if this is something that could be an exposure in your area um, you're going to want to use the sludge m signs and symptoms uh, when it comes to the nerve agents and then finally you have the riot control agents um, these are usually not going to be a life-threatening uh, because they've been developed as a control agent so this are going to be things like your tear gas uh, and such they're more irritants uh, than anything so the dot has a emergency response guidebook and this is going to provide information on common terrorist weapons now with that you're going to have uh, strategies and tactics uh, that you're going to utilize in these types of situations the difference is going to be strategies are broad general plans designed to achieve desired outcomes whereas tactics are going to be specific to the operational actions responders take to accomplish the assigned task so strategies are more of a broad group tactics are more of a attack at the point group the first goal in these type of situations are going to be uh, the initial consideration so you're going to want to control the scene kind of contain what's going on figure out the dynamics of what's going on and then get all the appropriate resources there isolate the hazard if possible and then attempt to conduct a controlled evacuation um, and this is going to be a large-scale event this is not something that if you roll up on this and you're the first unit there you're going to be able to do this you're going to need police fire specialty units you're going to need all kinds of things to uh, properly accomplish this um, but the controlled evacuation would be to um, get the people out of harm's way hopefully to a safe zone keep them together uh, and then move forward from there hopefully simultaneously you're going to be establishing a perimeter control which hope hopefully law enforcement's going to take care of and that's going to be 
create a perimeter around the incident, keeping everybody out that hasn't already been in. There's going to obviously be a lot of factors involved with the perimeter control. Um, you know, the amount and type of resources that you have on hand. Uh, if if you're in a small rural area, uh, you may start with a very small group, and it's going to be hard to to do a proper perimeter control. Um, the capability of the available resources. So, what can those resources do? Um, what what is the capacity and level that they can provide for you? The ability of the resources to self-protect. Uh, obviously, if a, a nuclear bomb were to go off someplace that didn't have nuclear capabilities, it's going to be hard for them to go in there and control a perimeter um, because they aren't going to have the ability to protect themselves. The size and the configuration of the event. So obviously, if it's a, a bomb within say a classroom at a school that's going to be different than what happened at 9 11 with the twin towers and then the stability of the scene um and you know the chaos that goes with it but is there still the opportunity and chance for you know secondary explosions uh, more fallout things of that nature, um, those all play a role in controlling that perimeter. And a terrorist event notification is going to play a, a critical role to get those um, state, you know, federal, local authorities there um, to get all of the resources there that need, need to be able to handle this situation. So generally speaking, as an EMS provider, it's not something you're going to have a great deal of involvement in. However, if you are the first unit on scene, your job in the notification process is going to be to let the dispatchers know what's going on so that they can start the notification process. They'll be able to do that on the backside um, so that you can focus on what your job at hand while you're on scene is. If you're there and you have the ability, identification is also an important factor. Um, so observe anything that can help you identify what the potential material could be. If you do figure it out, consult your ERG, uh, use your resources such as ChemTrack or ChemTel, um, make the proper notifications, um, and just get everything rolling. Again, from an EMS standpoint, probably a minimal role, but if, it, if you're the first one there and you can identify it, you can help the process along and perhaps save lives down the road because of early notification. Protection of critical assets is an important function in the terrorist event. EMS critical assets include uh, people, vehicle, and equipment and supplies. So your goal as an EMS provider is these are the things that you protect. Uh, you want to make an initial scene size up to determine the security threats. Always consider that secondary device that could be out there. You want to request uh, protection via radio as soon as uh, practical. So um, security, police, fire, whatever the case may be. And then you want to establish a vehicle staging as well as a triage treatment area in the protected locations. So uh, these are things that need to be done kind of in the safe zone, if you want to say. Advise EMS command or incident command of protection and security concerns. Uh, and then the last thing to look at with protection is immediately report any suspicious people or activities. You'd be surprised uh, how many times uh, the person that caused it wants to be there to see it. Um, you see it in things like arson all the time. They start the fire, they wanna be there to see the fire department roll in and try to put it out. Uh, same goes true with terrorist events. Uh, you'd be surprised a lot of times you'll, they'll set the device off, but the person that set the device off will actually be there wanting to watch the outcome of the incident. And then another area that you will probably be involved in is the decontamination process. 
uh, which again is going to be removing the surface contamination via mechanical means or initial rinsing. It, it may be as simple as uh, taking them to a sink or a safety shower, having them hose off. It may be a more uh, complicated decontamination process where you have fire apparatus set up and you're deconning them into um, basically small pools and the water's collected and it's, it's a whole big process. Um, but the amount of surface contamination gets significantly reduced uh, by going through this decontamination process, uh, which is kind of the goal of it. Final topic here is going to be the self-protection uh, at a terrorist event. And this is kind of fitting that you're ending on a topic that you basically started this textbook with, and that is your own personal protection. You can't take care of anybody if you are injured or hurt yourself. So last section here, um, start with the scene size up and, and situational awareness. Look for things like, um, are the patients displaying signs of hazardous substance exposure? Are there multiple unconscious patients? Look for that sludge M signs. Look for multiple patients with blistering, reddening of skin, and then look for multiple patients having difficulty breathing. If you have any of these, maybe start to think there could be the potential there of it being one of these events that we're learning about. It can be challenging as well, um, but some things if you come into these situations um, that you need to be thinking potential terrorist activity, um, anytime you have a medical mass casualty or fatalities with minimal or no trauma, um, it, that's just kind of unexplained. Like, why why are there so many? This doesn't make any sense. Well, then you should be maybe thinking along those lines. Um, anytime you have responder casualties, um, anytime that you have dead animals or vegetation, um, usually that's a precursor to uh, those are going to be the things that die first. Um, anytime you have unusual odors, colors of smoke, uh, vapor clouds, um, you know, those would be times where you want to almost evacuate immediately and then have somebody determine if the scene is safe again for you. Be thinking about the auto acronym with the um, when you're thinking about clues for suspicion of terrorist involvement. So occupancy or location, be thinking about the type of event, uh, be thinking of the timing. Is this a holiday or an important anniversary date of something going on? Um, be looking for on-scene clues. Um, you know, if you go to an explosion, be cognizant of things like bags that are sitting alone because it could be secondary devices. So uh, use all your senses with this. And just kind of be thinking 99.9% .9 of the time it's not going to be anything that you need to be concerned about but it never hurts to just be aware of your surroundings and what's going on as an EMS provider it's also important to remember your job is life safety so more times than not there's going to be no need for you to rush in so take your time wait until the appropriate authorities say the scene is safe don't put yourself in harm's way Odds are you're not going to be an incident commander, so follow the incident commander protocols. Don't ever freelance and go do your own thing. Uh, that's not your job either. Take your time. Make sure that you're wearing your proper PPE, whatever it is, even if it's just gloves and a gown, or maybe it's something much more extravagant than that. Make sure that you have the appropriate PPP on for the situation you're in. Be aware of the secondary devices. They, they talk many times about this, but it's become more of a common practice that they want to cause this initial incident, and then they want to take out responders. So be aware of the secondary explosive devices. Beware of booby traps, uh, anything that, that could cause injury to you. Search all patients for explosives or weapons. Remember, Somebody put it there, and there's nothing to say that couldn't be your patient. So make sure that you're safe with your patient. And I mean, this should go anytime. You know, if you have a battery call 
and you're transporting one of the battery patients, I mean, you should have PD make sure that they don't have a weapon on them. Same thing goes for here. Just make sure you're safe with your patients, check them over, make sure that there's no weapons or anything that could get you in trouble down the road. Remember the things that we've already talked about. Understand that TRACE MP HARMS acronym. Uh, really importantly, remember the time distance shielding. That's a big thing for EMS. Um, you know, like we talked about, your job is life safety. So there's a time and a place when you're going to be put to work, and it may not be at the onset of the event. It is important to remember that. Remember at a chemical incident, chemical harm is the priority. At a biological incident, the etiology harm is a priority. So it kind of you know, think about coming to the fork in the road, and you need to pick which path you're going down. That's what you need to be thinking about when you come to these incidents. And then obviously a radiological nuclear incident, the radiologic harm is going to be your primary. And at an explosive incident, the thermal and the mechanics are going to be the primary. Remember that the thermal is the initial with the explosion blast, and then the secondary is going to be the mechanical, uh, where all the shrapnel, um, it's common these bombers, they're, um, the Boston Marathon bombing, they filled um, basically pressure cookers with BBs and anything else that they could put in there that was going to cause damage so that when it blew, those projectiles caused it. That's going to be the mechanical harms. Know your resources. Understand that um, there's a national stockpile of resources for these large-scale incidents, but you also need to understand your local resources, your regional resources, and so on. And finally here, understand that there are current trends of active shooters, mass shootings, um, cyber terrorism is a big thing right now. Um, you're starting to see a lot more uh, use of uh, drugs of abuse as they, they're cutting in uh, chemical weapons into those. those. These are all things that can be uh, considered terroristic events depending and it may change you know over the course of your career you're going to see a number of different things um, same goes true with terrorism uh, you know five years from now it might be something completely different uh, time will tell and we just need to be prepared uh, so that we can do our job and save lives and that's the end of the chapter and happily that's the end of the textbook for you uh, go through the chapter review with this. Um, there, there's a lot of time spent on uh, listening to lectures for this last unit. Uh, knock out that final quiz, uh, and then you have the final exam uh, that's going to be a cumulative of everything uh, that you've learned up to this point. So uh, kind of review it. Uh, again, use your textbook as a, a good tool. There's um, some good images and uh, other such information in your textbook that pertain to this as well. If you have questions, let us know.